one look at the slotted SCP controller, SCP-1, 2, or 3, uh, often has people kind of daunted by the number of controls on the controller. Uh, so I wanted to share how I help other people learn how to use the various features on this controller. Step number one, only do one thing at a time. And I'm going to just ignore the buttons for now, because generally they only apply for digital, though they also have functions for analog. But we're just going to focus on the knobs and switches. And I'm going to start with the ones that are most important to most people. So we're going to turn the green one all the way down to zero. They call that power trim. Other people call it anti-span or traction control. We'll go over that in a little bit. And also turn the blue knob down and the fast standard slow switch to standard. We'll mess with those later. For now we're going to focus on brakes and min speed, otherwise known as sensitivity to um, most other controllers. So by focusing only on these two knobs, you essentially turn the slotted controller into a two knob style adjustable controller like a professor motor controller or a number of other controllers on the market that have brakes and sensitivity. Now sensitivity basically means, and why it's labeled min speed on the slotted controller, means as soon as the controller detects trigger motion, you know, it detects the, the less or the more than zero point, that's how much uh, percentage of power the car is going to get. So if you have that at zero, then it's going to be zero power at zero trigger and then move up from there. So I picked a car that makes a lot of noise so you can hear because you're not really going to be able to see the wheel spin. But watch how little I move the trigger and listen to the car noise. Can you hear that? It's doing a whining noise because it's getting power but not enough to turn the motor over. And the SAP indicates that it's going off of zero by that light going out. So to get the motor moving, I gotta give it more power. If I turn this up, then I'm giving it more power at the very bottom of the trigger. So if I turn this to maximum, you'll hear the car actually go when I just get the trigger moving. That's like 50% power. And of course, anywhere in between. So what I usually like to do is set the car so I've got some room to go and then barely touch the trigger and then turn that knob up until the car moves on its own. So it looks like about 15% is good for that. And the reason I do that is because I don't want to waste motion in the trigger when the car doesn't even go. Right? So that's a bunch of wasted motion right there that I could be using for actually controlling the car. So this car, you know, a minimum speed is going to be 15%. It actually gets the car moving when I just touch the trigger. Very slowly. But it does it. Uh, cars with slower motors or lots of magnetic downforce or drag or other reasons that it doesn't go very fast until you get to a higher power level, turning that up can help. Uh, so, for example, for a, this is a non-magnet car, but if this car had a magnet in it, I might turn that up to 30 or 40 or more. Because the car is not going to go at all until it gets that much power. Now, let's turn that back down to zero for now. And we're going to focus on the brake knob. Now, the slot at brake knob is a little bit different than other controllers because it has two sides. It has fixed and sweep, is what they usually call it. Uh, I usually stay to the fixed side because I don't notice a big difference, but basically the difference between fixed is from the moment you let go of the trigger to turn to activate brakes until there's no more power left in the motor from braking, 
it's a set amount of resistance. So, you know, if you set it to max, then it's going to be the maximum amount of resistance the controller can give until all the power is dissipated by the motor and the controller from braking. Now, if you switch to the sweep side, it's kind of, it gives the most resistance at first, and then the amount of resistance diminishes as the power generated by the motor during braking decreases. Uh, so it's so I kind of described the effect. I believe the 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 desired effect is kind of like when you're coming to a complete stop in your car, but before you come to a complete stop, you usually lift up on the brakes a little bit so that everybody in the car doesn't just jerk forward. It kind of eases into it at the end. Now, as I said, I don't notice a big difference while I'm driving around. And that might be because of the type of cars I'm driving or the type of racing that I'm doing. So I would say experiment with this, but just like any other brake knob, the more you turn it up, the more brakes there are, and you want to turn it down, the less brakes there are. In this case, zero is straight up. It's got a zero at, at the top on the label. And then all the way to one side is full fixed, and all the way to the other side, counterclockwise, is full sweep. So <clears throat> I usually just turn it somewhere in the middle, until I find out whether or not the car I am using has enough brakes or not. So I'll give an audio example of the brake level. I'm going to turn it up to maximum. And you can pretty much hear the, the car come to its, you know, the, the wheels come to a stop pretty much instantly. Now if I turn that down to zero, you should basically hear them coast to a stop. A little bit... Not much of a difference on this car because the gear mesh is not very good, so it doesn't have a very smooth uh, mesh. But you can hear the difference. And a, a good way to, to know for sure that you are using zero brakes is to compare that sound with the way the car sounds when you just lift it off the track. So I'm going to just go full power and then I'm going to lift the car off the track so you can hear what it sounds like. Because that's basically no brakes at all. No resistance, it's just the natural resistance of the gear mesh and the motor. and then compare that with zero brakes on the controller. Pretty much the same. Uh, with other cars you'll you'll hear and feel more of a difference, so you pretty much gotta play with play around with min speed and brake to get what the feel you like for that car. Now we're gonna get a little bit more complicated and this is the stuff that's harder for most people to understand, or this is the stuff that's harder for people to understand when they're first getting in with the controller. This is why I always suggest only playing with one control at a time. Don't mess with anything else until you understand what each individual thing is doing. So for the power trim, or again, anti-lock or um, anti-spin or whatever, um, it basically tells the controller over how much time do you want it to take to get the motor from zero to maximum speed? So if I have zero, then it's going to go full power right away. And you can hear that when I pull the trigger to full, it goes full power. It's pretty much, pretty much instantaneous. But if I turn that all the way up so you can hear the difference, what you're going to hear is the motor going up to full speed gradually it only takes like one second, but you'll hear the pitch go up. You'll, you'll actually hear the pitch change. Did you hear that? It's kind of a... That's because it's going from slow to fast in an amount of time that you can actually perceive. Now, it's a very subtle difference between zero and what's labeled here as five but then you get to feel it a lot more and hear it a lot more between 5 and 10. So let's say I'll set it to 2, and I believe it's logarithmic or whatever the word is for getting more and more, higher and higher, uh, not linear. <laughs> but on 2, you can barely hear it. Now you're going to feel that more on a track than just hearing the audio, but I want you to hear the audio so you can understand. You wouldn't really be able to see it if I were to drive this car around because you're not the one with your finger on the controller. So if I turn that to five, you might be able to hear a little bit. 
barely. But I'm going to just go up to what looks like about six and a half. Now you can start to hear it. Go to eight. Now you can really hear it. And then ten. Uh, so that that helps you understand what that knob does. Now, in practice, what that means is, for example, if you have a tendency to hit the throttle too soon out of a turn, and so your car goes wiggly wagging down the straightaway, turning that up will kind of uh, mitigate that because you're going to be pulling the trigger early, but it's not going to give the car full power at the same time. It's going to take a, a second or a split second to give the car full power. So hopefully by that time your car is straighter than it it normally is when you pull the trigger and doesn't wiggle down the straights quite so much. Uh, it also helps when cars have really great traction and they tend to wheelie out of the slot. If you go full power and you have great traction and a light front end it'll actually wheelie up and sometimes it'll just go off to the side. So turning that can can help mitigate that problem. And I'm sure you'll find other uses for it as well. Uh, now let's move on to the, I'm going to kind of do these at the same time, the, the standard fast slow switch and the blue knob. Uh, and these, these pretty much all have a similar effect in curve versus linear mode, which is what this switch does on the back. It's also the power switch for the SCP-3. Um, so you'll kind of want to experiment as well as, you know, look through the manual to kind of see what these things do. But... The easiest way to understand them is that switching the switch from slow to, f to medium to fast or turning the blue knob up from zero shifts the middle point of the trigger to a different location so that you're getting more power or less power in the middle of the trigger. You're, you've, you pretty much are always going to have 100% power at max trigger and whatever your min speed is at zero trigger. But then how does the power change along the way? So if I turn this to slow, and I turn the blue knob to zero, I'm going to try to move the trigger the same each time. But what you should hear with slow and zero is that there's, there's not a whole lot of power for most of the trigger motion until I get closer to max. pretty much jumped there at the end. Now if I flip those all the way to fast and 10, you're going to hear the power get a lot more, uh, you're, you're going to hear the motor get a lot more power at the low end, and there's not going to be nearly so much of a jump at the high end. And of course, setting it somewhere in between is going to be something that you have to experiment with. Uh, so usually, what I do when I get a when I put a brand new car on the track is I set the fast, medium switch to standard, fast, fast, standard, slow, set it to standard right in the middle, and I usually set my blue knob down to like two or three. I set my brakes about halfway. I set my minimum speed to about 10 or 15, and I usually set the, the power, uh, power trim to like 5 or 6 or so. So basically, you just kind of make a straight line across the top three knobs, set that one to medium or standard, and then this one low but not completely off. And then I drive the car around. And if I feel that it's not getting enough power quickly enough on the straights, then I'll turn the power trim down. Or if the motor is really hot and hard to manage, I'll go ahead and turn it up. Similarly, if the motor is uh, slow and I feel like I need more power at the beginning of the straights, I might turn up my power trim, uh, my min speed up a little bit. Or if it's a really hot motor, I'll turn that down. Similarly, if it's a really hot motor, uh, really fast, I'll turn this top switch to slow and maybe turn the blue knob down a little bit. 
And again, if it's a slower motor or if I just feel like I need more power in the middle range of the trigger before I get to 100%, I'll go ahead and switch those to fast and turn that up a little bit. Uh, for non-magnet racing, I tend to be uh, in the in the standard or slow for the for the switch on top, and then down here in the two three area for the blue. I prefer curve for my lin linear curve option, um, and then depending on traction, I might turn this up or most of the time I honestly have that off because I've trained myself not to hit the gas until I until the car is pretty much in the straightaway. Uh, if I'm doing a magnet car, then I'll definitely turn that completely off. I'll turn my brakes down, usually very, very low if not completely off. And I'll turn the min speed up to maybe 20 or 30, because the car's not going to move until it's got a good amount of power. And then I'll switch the, the top switch to fast and maybe turn the, the blue knob up, knob up a little bit. Again, you're going to have to experiment with all these, but uh, rule number one is only change one knob at a time okay so mess around with the min speed knob but don't change anything else and drive the car around a bit once you think you know what that does set it to what you want it to be and then tweak brakes and then tweak the the uh, curve max knob and then tweak the, the fast slow switch and then tweak the, the uh, power trim knob but just one at a time until you fully understand what each and every control is doing the buttons uh, for analog racing is, uh, let's see, well they took the labels off of that, so with the SCP-1 it's labeled, so uh, the up arrow button makes the next time you release the, the trigger for brakes is going to be 100% brakes, so even if you have your brakes turned down somewhere uh, and you press that button, then the next time you let go of the trigger it's going to be 100% brakes. That's useful for if you have a a very technical uh, layout but one really long straight with a really tight turn at the end you might have your brakes turned down to make it easier to go through the technical bits but want to use hundred percent brakes at the end of the longest straight so then you just wait till you get to the straight you're going full speed you hit the button and then next time you let go full brakes uh, the down arrow button is basically while you hold it it's hundred percent brakes so you could do half of your lap with full brakes and the other half with with whatever your knob is set to. And the round button is hand brakes and that's basically activate this level of braking when you push the button. So you can have you can keep your trigger motion, you know, wherever you normally drive, or, you know, whatever you're doing with the trigger and then just press the brake button to activate brakes rather than release the trigger. I don't race like that, but I know there are some people out there who do. Uh, and that's basically what the controller does. From from SCP-1, 2, and 3, everything pretty much has the same functionality. Uh, the main difference between 1 and 2 slash 3 is that the fast, slow, standard switch are these dip switches on the top. So you got to look at the manual to figure out which option you want to set those to, and then experiment and figure out your, your favorite option, and then just generally leave them there while you tweak the other things. Uh, so I'm definitely a fan of the fast, slow, standard switch, um, which has been around since the SCP-2. Um, I didn't really go into a whole lot of detail between linear and curved. It, it basically is something that you'll want to experiment with. Again, it affects how the power is provided between minimum and maximum. So it's either going to be you know, more linear or more of a curve. <laughs> I know that's not very helpful, but you kind of got to get your finger on the trigger to, to, to really learn this controller. And do it with a lot of different cars. Do it with magnet cars. Do it with fast cars. Do it with slow cars. Do it with non-magnet cars. And, and experiment with each knob with each car until you can basically just pick up the controller, put a car on the track, pull the trigger a few times, and then turn the knobs to what you want, and then start racing. Eventually you'll get there, but only if you Keep in mind what each knob does while you're trying to learn the controller. Don't don't change a bunch at once because you won't really know what gave you the the results that you got until you understand them all. Hopefully that's helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to comment, 